at the last time this conference happened, I said I'd give a technical talk. I didn't want to give a managerial procedural talk. Uh, a number of things have happened since then, so I have to give another managerial talk. Uh, but here's a cool, a cool technical tip of the day. Uh, this is my build server running right now. It's actually at a load of, oh, it's pretty low. It's only 400. Um, but it's a cool tool called BTOP, and it's slow. Anyway, it can handle stuff like that. Just a neat thing. Never mind. Um, so if you have to manage large numbers of systems that work heavy under load, use BTOP. It was originally written in Bash. Think of that, Bash top. Um, okay, my talk. Cool. Okay, let's talk about trust. Not Rust, trust. I don't want to talk about Rust. That's in a couple years from now. There is trust in Rust. I, I. Um, first off. This is me, I'm speaking for myself, my personal opinion, hopefully I can convince you of the same, but it doesn't reflect anybody else. All right, so let's start with this. Um, this is the old idea, like Linus's old talk, with all, enough bugs, enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. Transfer that to real world. The real world issue is, and I'm gonna show how, I'm gonna, pro, I'm gonna try and prove this, that with open source software is more trustworthy than closed source. And it's actually hopefully not an argument anymore. People still like making that argument. Um, and this is the reason. You can audit it at any time by anyone. And that's really important. And also, you can fix, it can be fixed by anyone. And you can do this, and you can also, I'll talk about later, you can go backwards in time. And backwards in time is very powerful. I'll point out um, a number of years ago, Juniper Networks um, Networking Appliances were found to have um, bugs. And those bugs were supposedly planted there by random developers working for other agencies. Um, but a lot of questions a lot of people came up with was, what other problems were there in those systems? What other problems did those developers add? Because they're closed source, nobody ever knows. With open source, you can go back in time and figure that out because fixes are public, fixes are trackable, Pictures are traceable by people. You can track who did what. Metadata is actually out there. So here's what happened. This is the this talk. This conference is great. I have to give a new talk every year, and the best thing is I can give it once and then never have to give it again. So this is the last time I want to talk about this topic. <laughs> Hopefully. So I'm going to talk about what happened in the past. Um, it was well documented. I'll give you a pointer to the report. And then what has happened since then? Because this hasn't stopped. So, in the beginning, 2018, 2020, um, various small fixes were coming from this university. Uh, this turns out to be the university that is my boss's alumni. <laughs> um, and there's also alumni of um, a number of kernel developers have gone to the school. So this isn't yeah, okay, there we go, Kevin. Um, this isn't unique to this school. This is unique to a number of people at that school. Um, this isn't systemic for that. Oh, and please heckle and ask questions during this. So it's more fun that way. So a lot of patches were coming. Many were submitted. Many were accepted. Nobody really cared. Um, what happened that brought this to people's attention is they started sending some patches that were called hypocrite commits. Because during the previous amount of time, the professor who was submitting patches realized that a lot of his submissions were being rejected. And they were being rejected properly because they were wrong. But it turns out also a lot of things that were being accepted were wrong. So he came up with the idea like, oh, let's talk about how you can submit a, an incorrect patch knowingly. And what you can do about that. He came up with the idea to write a paper about it. Um, they tried to create patches that were wrong and submit them. They um, submitted four of them. Actually, they submitted five. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and one was accepted because it was correct. <laughs> These guys tried, and they documented in their paper, here's this really cool, tricky way to write a patch that's wrong, and it's doing the wrong thing, and nobody's going to catch it. Ha-ha! It turned out it was correct. <laughs> that leads you to suspect a few things behind the people behind this. These patches, and I'll talk about that too. Um, 
this was published. This paper was pre-released. Um, it came up to a number of peoples. Um, I want to call out Sarah Jamie Lewis for calling it to our attention. A number of people got in this room probably got emailed about this, saying, hey, there's this paper being submitted. It's been accepted by IEEE. Um, they were researching on you guys without you knowing it. And in the real world, you're not supposed to, well, in the nice world, you're not supposed to research on people without them knowing about it. There's ethical issues about that. Anthropologists have known about this for years. Political scientists have known about this for years. Um, for some reason, computer scientists don't think of us as people. Ah, we're people. Um, so they, um, people complained about this. The it looked like the researchers backtracked and said, oh yes, we really did have approval um, by our internal review board. Um, we gave an exception about it. That's one point that's never actually been clarified. Universities never clarified whether they really did ex go through the review. And that's up to them. That's their own processes. That's an academic issue. And then they are issued a clarification to IEEE saying, yes, all is good. We knew about this, yada, yada, yada. Um, all was fine, the kernel community, we didn't care about it, whatever. We saw that the commits went, never got accepted. Um, didn't think anything of it. Six months later, and that's a couple months later, they started sending more patches, because they went off and did something else. Um, bad pun, sorry. Um, a number of us saw this and said, what is going on? These are obviously wrong commits. Are they trying to do this again, but actually using their real names? Um, I called him out on this, said, please stop sending this stuff. It was wrong. Um, don't main, don't research on us. You already wrote one paper. Don't keep doing more. Um, they said, no, 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 no. This has nothing to do with you guys. We're just sending out patches and, oh, yeah, maybe they are wrong. Okay, that's not very nice. I say, stop. Please stop. Let's all figure this out. We can audit everything. Please calm down. And then all hell broke loose. I admit I took it to Twitter, which I shouldn't have. <laughs> but it worked. I mean, I wanted to call attention to the fact that you shouldn't research on us. We are people. We have feelings. Um, there are legal and ethical issues involved here. Please don't do this. People actually care about Linux. They use Linux. So I start reviewing everything. I had 10 interns at the time. I let them loose on this stuff. They were so happy to do this. Really, they did a great job. Um, we said, let's review everything. Case Cook got involved and said, let's go even further back in time and review really everything. Uh, um, David Wheeler from Linux Foundation is a really well-known security researcher. He's a teacher, I think, at John Hopkins, said, this is bad. This is, you, people should not be researching on trying on open source projects. They should not be purposefully introducing bugs, if that's what they're doing. They should not be doing this. And then the academics got involved, and they were just so pissed. Um, but the lawyer, oh, then the lawyers. I did not do this. The lawyers wrote a letter <laughs> to the University of Minnesota and said, we want to know everything you really did. Document it all. We're working in public. Document everything. You need to withdraw your paper. This is not ethical. You need to ensure everything that you do going forward is okay, and it's been approved, and you need to ensure that you don't experiment on people without them knowing it. This is the lawyers got involved. Um, it's fun when the lawyers are on your side. Um, the university published an open letter. We're all so sorry we didn't mean to do this. And then they withdraw the paper a few days later, hours before IEEE was about to reject it. The IEEE people were pissed because they accepted a paper that it turns out was wrong. These researchers lied in their paper about what they were doing. They lied about how they did it. And they even lied that they got patches in or they submitted things that were wrong. They were right. <laughs> um, do not mess with academic um, paper boards. These guys know how to get back at you. Um, so they were about to reject it. I was on some mailing lists or some internal mails from them. It was fun to just watch them sit back and do it. Uh, but the university withdrew it. Um, just before it was published, before they were about to reject it. I probably was pissed that they didn't get to it sooner. <laughs> but um, then they did. Um, they withdrew the paper on that date. 
They responded to our comments. They said everything's going to be fine. We will, we will work on training our facility, our faculty. We'll do it next year and this year. We're so sorry. We're going to get on doing this stuff. Um, in the meantime, we've been auditing all these stuff. I ripped out a whole bunch of patches, reverted them, fixed them properly. Everything went on. It was good. And then Case Cook and me and the Technical Advisory Board published a detailed report. There's a link to it. And it's, I mean, for some trivial patches, this had the most words written ever about trivial patches. Um, but it's cool. It, it's good. It's, we prove that you can go back in time. You can find everything that came from a particular entity and then some, because we found things that people didn't even realize, um, and audit them again and see what's wrong with them, see if it's good, see if it's bad, see if it's correct. And we did that. And in the summary of this paper, this research, or this report, um, we reviewed, reviewed 439 or 35 patches. Some people in this room helped out a lot. Uh, thank you very much. 95 people overall helped out, uh, which was amazing. Uh, thank you for taking your time to do this. It wasn't fun. But as, think of it as just a patch review test. A number of us took these patches in the first place. <laughs> Um, we confirmed that everything that they intentionally submitted as bad were rejected. Um, that was good. And the one patch that was accepted, we did remove it because it was submitted under a fake name. And we do not knowingly take patches from anonymous people, from people with fake names. We can unknowingly accidentally do it if you make up a fake name, but we do not knowingly. That's against our legal rules of the kernel, the developer's certificate of origin. We say you can't do that. So we ripped it out. Um, it was a dumb, it was a print, it was a debug print message. Um, it turns out the huge majority of the patches they submitted were correct. But um, the overall, these patches were really, really bad. Um, 25 of these had already been fixed by other commits. 39 of them needed new fixes. So overall, the percentage of these of accepted patches were about 20%. And if you look at our numbers, I'll give us some numbers later. This is really, really high for bad work. Um, the reason these were accepted mostly is because of where these were submitted for. These were submitted for um, really obscure drivers. Famously, the, the Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player module init code error handling path that nobody's ever hit the patch um, would leak resources. <laughs> If this fix went in, these fixes went in, it was a lot of cleanup paths. They were cleaning up error method, error recovery paths that are never hit in the first place, obviously, because nobody has a Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player. And they were, I mean, a maintainer sees these, like, okay, yeah, that looks correct. Because you have to unwind, you have to see more context in this stuff. So they were submitting cleanup patches that were not really cleaning up and were actually causing more problems. But because they were never hit, they didn't really actually cause the problems. None of those 400 and some patches actually were anything that anybody has ever run in the real world. So we were good. We were all, all was calm. We we're all happy. But again, 20% of this, this is a really, really high rate of error, um, were incorrect. Um, a number of people who saw this and saw the errors that they were submitting, I think there's, I don't remember who said it. I know, I think Alviro said it. Um, maybe somebody else. Sounds like something Al had said is, you are creating something that, if we didn't know better, was intentionally malicious. Because you're maliciously submitting something that looks correct but is wrong. And um, it's really, really hard to detect if you're just not that smart or if you're malicious. I mean, there's this famous quote, right? <laughs> um, I err towards the stupidity here. <laughs> Um, others claim the malicious side of this. Um, either way, it doesn't matter, it's wrong, and we need to fix this. Um, what, what is nice is that it showed a problem or a potential problem that people thought we had, that we handled it really well. We recovered, we audited, we proved that this was okay, um, because this has been a theoretical attack vector for a long time. I know Ted So has talked about this for like 20 years. Um, I don't know. People can argue whether this was intentionally malicious or not. I, I'll get, stay out of that argument. Um, one interesting thing is, and again, the university never has really addressed this, 
they intentionally did an illegal thing in their paper. And this is what really made IEEE mad. Because they agreed to a legal document, a legal statement with a fake identity. That's not very ethical. Um, the ethics of people who do anthropology and other things like that are really up in arms about that. I'll let the academics argue that. But that's why the lawyers got involved. And that's why the lawyers at the university got mad too. But that's up to them. So let's talk about the patches. Um, these are links to the patches. The patchwork are on lore, in case I dug them all out. This one was valid. <laughs> um, and they claimed it was invalid. This one is why some of us err towards the side of the stupidity, not maliciousness. <laughs> Um, because these developers obviously don't understand some basic C functional programming issues and how the kernel works. You can look at the patch yourself um, to see that it really is a valid commit. Um, but it shows that you, the people involved did not understand the basics of how drivers work, um, which is kind of interesting. Second commit was, um, this was funny. <laughs> So my talk in 2019 was about how CV stuck here at this conference. Spawned a whole talk. I point people at it all wonder what this a patch based on that talk was the forefront of that talk about how bad it was and what it caused us to do and yada yada yada. It was the center of that talk. They duplicated that that same patch and sent it to me, <laughs> expecting I would accept this. Um, they picked the wrong thing to do. <laughs> um, they tried to create a patch that I had seen in the past. I wrote a talk about. Um, again, malicious, maybe not. I, not the smart. I instantly rejected it just based on the fact of why are you trying to send me the same crap again. Um, this is where things that really made me mad and why academics should be concerned. Um, the maintainer quickly recognized this was wrong. And then they started offering suggestions. Because as maintainers, we want to help you out. We want to help new developers out. We want to help you along and so you can become a productive member of our community. We take our time out of our, uh, of our own time to help you out. We teach. We want to lecture. We want to encourage. We want to educate. This maintainer did that. They took a lot of time. They tried to explain the problem. They tried to help them out. They tried to do this. And as academics, the university should also recognize that that's a valid thing to do. You want to teach. You want to help. You want to do that stuff. You don't waste your teacher's time and energy and efforts. And these guys did that. The maintainer was completely ignored. And all that effort and time that he took was a couple hours, thinking back and forth, was dropped on the floor on the, on the reason that somebody was trying to do a research paper. Academics should really care about that. The IEEE was really mad about this. Because those were academics, they're researchers, they're teachers. They want to see people do better. They don't want to have their time wasted. That's what made a lot of people mad. Fourth patch. This wasn't that bad. Um, at least the maintainer instantly caught it. The person right back saying, so sorry, and disappeared. Um, again, wasted maintainer time. They offered a number of possible solutions. Didn't care about it. And then there was a fifth patch. It turns out that the developer who was writing this paper forgot how they set up their computer <laughs> and sent out what they thought was a real fix, and they sent it under the fake name. <laughs> they thought they meant to send it under their real name because they were trying to do something. Um, that was really funny. They didn't mean to send out a bad patch. It was incorrect based on the developer's work. They didn't mean to send a patch from an invalid person. They did because they forgot how they configured Git. Uh, fun thing. Here was the name that they used. Uh, so the names they used were this and then another very common name that was pretty obvious. Um, anyway, that's why. It was pretty funny that somebody sent it out like that, that way. Um, so in summary, we caught it all. Everything was caught by maintainers. Did a good job. Our development model, people can claim, yay, it works. We do good stuff. Um, this whole issue that they submitted stuff that was rejected and caught was totally and completely ignored by the paper. The main thesis of the paper is here how you submit things that can slip by people, and <laughs> that's not what actually happened. Again, this is what really pissed off the IEEE people, because what actually happened in their experiment was not what they documented 
what's going to happen in their experiment. And they kind of weasel around a little bit, but the, their summary of why they did all this work was actually proven wrong by the real world experiment. Um, so, yay, our development model works, right? We got lucky. These were very um, incompetent attempts to do this. Um, I feel we got lucky. Um, but something, I'll talk a little bit interesting about something. Um, we trust our developers, and we trust our developers a lot. And that's good. And a lot of people were worried that why are we trusting developers? And they out, people outside our community were like, we should change the way we trust our developers. And I'll argue that the way we trust things are good. So anyway, let's talk about the timeline again. Keep things kept going on. The university met with me and Case and the Linux Foundation people said we're going to try and fix this. We're going to do better. We're so sorry. IEEE published a great statement how they violated the ethical guidelines. What's going to be put in place to ever stop this again? IEEE has gone above and beyond and changed their rules and changed their things that they require. The people who submit papers have to attest to and whatnot. They're doing a great job. IEEE is doing really good here. Um, they actually respond to our report. They said everything you did here was correct. We, um, they also identified one set of patches that we missed, which actually happened to be rejected anyway. <laughs> um, again, malicious or not, let you decide. And then they unequivocally state that they have not submitted anything to Linux or any other open source project. Because like Kubernetes came to me, uh, another, a number of other open source projects came to me and said, wait, are they researching on us too? Are they submitted problems here? The university said, no, this is only this one group over here. We can't tell our professors what to do. They went off and did this, but it was only in Linux. Well, no. Okay, so we reverted, ripped everything out. Everything got cleaned up, 513, ripped them out of all the stable kernels, fixed them all up. Everything is good. Everything is calm. Um, we should forget about it. Last year, all is good, right? That was the last anybody really heard of it. But no. Um, the professor behind all this emailed me and Case. Actually, I think emailed Case. My filters, I think, might have been blocking them. Case came to me again. And asked, basically said, hey, can we start sending patches again? We want to do some other. We're doing some tool. We want to send some patches. Can we do this? I thought that was a little odd. Thinking that the university took care of this, wouldn't take care of this, wouldn't handle this. We both say no. Um, we said no nicely. Said, don't you really think you know what you're doing? Please go talk to the university. Don't do this. Like, okay. All is good. They came back. This time I did not go to Twitter. <laughs> Because I wanted to, I wanted to figure out what's going on. A uh, number of developers, myself and a few people, maybe in this room, emailed me saying, "What's going on? They're sending crappy patches again. Have they learned? Have they done anything?" And I said, "I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening." So luckily, I happen to have the email address of the head of computer science at the university now, and their lawyers, and I told them. You agreed to do this. You agreed to set all this stuff in place. What is going on? You're doing it again. Um, they, I could, the um, administration was very upset. But <laughs> I mean, it is easier to ask forgiveness than permission, I guess. Um, they claimed ignorance. They're like, wait, hey, you never actually published your research or guidelines that you said you were gonna do, and oh, we never got around to it. We never talked to our professors. We never set anything in place. Gave a whole bunch of other valid excuses. I mean, it's tough running an organization, COVID, um, remote learning, not remote learning. Anyway, they said, we're so sorry. Okay. So, researcher guidelines. So, part of this work was, that came out of this was Case said, let's write a document that explains how you can research on us. Because we want to work with a lot of researchers. One reason I moved to Paris a number of years ago was to work with Julia and the group at the university there, because there's a lot of good academic work that applies and research that applies to the kernel. We want to have these interactions. University of Am in Amsterdam, I work with them as well. They found like 
the row hammer, the specter meltdown issues. We want to work together. Um, Real-time work has come from universities. But let's set some guidelines for people to know how to work with researchers, how researchers can work with the community. So we can also say, see, you violated our rules. Because sometimes people need to be told that they messed up. So Case came up with a great document. Julia, I don't think she's here, helped out with that. A number of other people helped out with that. Um, it's in the kernel now. There's a link to it. We expect you're acting in good faith. We default to, OK, you're doing good. If we were to default to the other way around, it wouldn't be a good development model. Um, you can research on all the passive data out there. Go mine our mailing list. Wonderful. We don't care about that. That's public data. But active research on us to try and do, get us to poke us and see how we respond, don't do that. We have to be told that you're going to do that. That's fine. I mean, I get about one email a week saying, please talk to us about this research study or things like that. I, base, they, I think they just troll the mailing list, um, which is good. I want to see good research stuff, but it has to be opt-in. And um, when you submit a patch and you're based on researchers, you need to have all this information in it. Because these people are submitting patches that basically said, fix the bug. Um, we want to know why this stuff. So you'll see a number of us maintainers now push back on, I found a bug based on a tool, and that's all they say. We want to know more. We want to know how this was found. When was it found? Why is it correct? And actually, this is a good thing that all bug fixes should have in their change log. Like you said, David said, put more information in your change log. These are all great things to have it in there for any bug fix, not just researchers. But researchers, please do this. The most interesting thing is, how can you actually find this problem? Have you actually hit this problem? Have you tested the fix? Because a lot of all these fixes that these people were submitting, and you'll see a number of other bug fixers submitting stuff lately, are things that they have obviously never tested. Because again, it was for the Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player module and it probe. Um, do we care about that really? Probably not. We should delete that driver. But tell me about that. Test that. And show me that you've tested that to prove it. We're going to put another barrier. Prove that you tested this and it works. That's all maintainers should push back on that. Unless it's obvious and you feel that I should take it. And we'll commit this fixed because we want to track. We want to track history and be able to track things over time. So that was good. So that happened in May, April. Finally, one of the reasons, one of the things the university said is we're going to take, bring in a uh, kernel developer from your community and help us fix it. Somebody instantly volunteered who happens to live in the town. Uh, he has a core kernel developer. He's been around for a long time. I trust him. And um, they finally <laughs> contacted him again because he had reached out in the beginning. And he's gone in and is starting to help them out. It looks like he might actually teach a class, which would be cool. Um, and they're going to work on that from there. Um, I think he's going to teach a class on how to work with open source communities. <laughs> And he also said he's going to teach a C basics class. <laughs> so that's it. I don't want to talk about this ever again. But the interesting thing is you can prove that with an open source body of code, you can work back in time and see what happened. You can audit code based on new information. Because we went back a long time in history to find out all these commits see the history of this professor and his graduate students, see what happened there. Oh, and I feel sorry for the graduate students. They didn't really know what they were doing. I put the full blame on the professor. They should know that. But you can go back in time. So our so open source projects, you can go back in time and look. We have Git history, we have pre-Git history. Other projects have all this stuff. This is good. This shows that you can trust the project. And you should be able to trust Linux because of that. So let's talk about trust. Big term. Should you trust Linux? Should you trust open source stuff? And the first thing that comes to a lot of our minds is no, fuck no. Um, who cares? Um, you're not forcing, we're not forcing you to use our tools. We're not forcing you to use our programs. In fact, we warranty in the license of our project says you don't trust us. We, we're, dis we're disclaiming trust for anything. No warranty whatsoever. Yay. We can go do what we want. Doesn't really work that way. <laughs> um, so let's talk about this. So other people instantly um, came up with their ideas of you must have uh, verification. You must verify all the developers to know who they are. 
So closed source verifies knows we know who contributes to our code base because we've hired them, we've vetted them, yada, yada, yada. I point out the Jupyter issue and people like wave that away. Uh, <laughs> these are people who are actually paid, and vetted by Juniper, Jupyter. Um, you must verify and all the developers. And I say, great, how would you do that for Linux? Here's the development model for Linux, right? I've given this slide for 15 years, 20 years. Developers, developer file, maintain. this is how our developers works. This is for 2021, 4,600 developers, right? 1,600 maintainers, 350 different subsystem trees. Linux, Andrew, and Linux Next get merged together daily. Email, email, get trees, yada, yada, yada. How are you going to verify 4,600 people from different countries all around the world, different organizations? How are you going to do that? Um, some people, I ask who you work for if you show up in the kernel log and I don't have an email address. Um, my most famous response was, I work for company X, Y, and this company X. Um, I am in charge of our kernel people. We have a policy that we're not allowing all any of our engineers to contribute to open source. I happen to be the manager of the team, and I submit this patch <laughs> under my own name. Um, there's somebody, there's some cognitive dissonance there um, who didn't want to know the world to know who he worked for because he was in charge of the policy that said he couldn't let his company contribute to open source, but he was contributing to open source. I took his fix. It was great. <laughs> so how are you going to do 4,600 developers? That's impossible. Everybody says, okay, I guess you really can't do that. So let's turn around and see how do we trust that these changes are good. What did we just do today? We talked about yesterday the um, kernel CI and the testing efforts. Um, talked about the zero day bot, and these things are good. So last year we had almost 80,000 commits. These are commits that have been accepted. I, I give the argument um, we only take about one third of the patches that have been take, sent to us. I was talking to Alexi and he says he's only taking one quarter of the patches it takes. It takes four times to submit a patch before he takes it. Um, so there's a huge number of quantity of out there that's much larger than this. So when you start showing these numbers to people who say we must put in place a verification of all your developers and every commit that they have, and I'm like, great, where's the, where do I point the fire hose to? And they give up. But let's look at this. So we have that many commits. We're fixing a lot of bugs. We said 17% of all the commits that we submitted last year that were accepted had a fixes tag. So they fixed this other commit over there. So it looks like it's kind of close to the, the university's failure rate, right? <laughs> Overall. Um, and, but this is all the commits that happened after they were in a tree. Because these were uh, things that were happened after they were in a tree or a local tree. Um, it doesn't matter, it would have been deleted. So these were found after they had a subsystem tree. So I went back and looked at and dug it out, and turns out we're fixing a lot of things before they ever hit a final tree, which is good. Made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, so of last year, 26% of the fixes were for the kernel release that hadn't been released yet. So every you know two week, two week merge window, release candidate, release candidate, release candidate. We should be submitting bug fixes only in there. Note that not all subsystems actually tag fixes. There's some subsystems, some file systems that are notorious and they never say they have ever fixed a bug because they never wrote a bug in the past. There's some file systems that you should not run. Um, anyway, those developers are working on that. Um, so it's not that bad. So overall, we fixed 12% of all, 12% of all the commits that went in the tree were for previous fixes. Now, it wasn't for the previous year. They were for the previous years behind that, all 25, 30 years. So it's not that bad of a rate. It's better. Overall, we're better than the university. So they were actually writing code that was twice as worse as the normal kernel developer. Um, so who's doing this? Who's writing all of the bugs in the kernel? Because we can track this, right? We have data. We can passively look at our data according to our researcher rules. Let's see. So last year, <laughs> no, no, this is, this is the developers. These are the people who wrote all the commits. Right? These were not bug fixes. Well, maybe they were. Um, this is top 20 people went to the tree. Um, some of them are in this room. Developers, this is all the work that happened that last year um, out of those 80,000 commits. Again, like Christoph only wrote 1% of all commits. Lee wrote 1%. Um, good stuff. So who wrote all the fixes? 
some of the same people. <laughs> some of the same people are fixing other things, which is cool. So um, people are writing fixes or fixing of other things. And um, that's good. So how about who they're writing the fixes for? The French, this was fun. It took three native French speakers to find the right word for this. Um, I, I don't want to call people out. I think that there's eight of these 10 people, including somebody on stage right now, that are on that list. And that's to be expected. If you look at who writes the most number of bugs, it's the people that write the most code. So are we going to say that our top 10 developers, top 20 long-term developers should not be writing code? Do we not trust them? You want to trust the top five people there. <laughs> Um, you do trust those people. Percentage of what? Of those people? Well, some people, I mean, one problem is, and I had to rule this out, like everybody marks things previous to Git as addressable that Linus caused the bug. <laughs> um, he didn't cause the bug. Um, I, I didn't go back. You, uh, you can mine Git. It's, it's really simple to do this stuff. It took a bash script. And I was running it yesterday. Some people saw me running it. Um, so the goal is the most I like saying I've written a ton of security bugs. I've written a ton of security holes. There's an infamous Red Hat bug that I wrote that caused all RHEL servers to be insecure because they didn't take the stable kernel updates where I fixed it. <laughs> um, but I didn't even realize it was a security hole. Do you not trust me? Um, I don't trust me. I don't trust you. I don't trust myself. We don't trust ourselves to write good code because we're human. Everybody gets things wrong at time. Everybody is stupid at times, right? It's hard to tell stupid from maliciousness. So let's take and not trust anybody. So let's make it easy to find and fix these bugs. And we've been doing that. For the past number of years, we've been doing it and making it easy to find and fix these bugs. The zero day runs on the mailing list submissions. This is the best thing ever from a maintainer's point of view, because if I see zero day respond to a patch, like it broke something, it causes a problem, I just instantly delete it and move on. This is before it ever hits a tree. Zero day is awesome there. I'm so happy about that. Once it hits a tree, kernel CI runs on a bunch of our maintainer trees, on almost all the subsystem trees. Get a report back saying it submitted a whole bunch of stuff. Zero day runs again on that thing and finds problems. And then people start submitting patches that say fixes based on this commit because we don't rebase our trees. Things start happening. We run more tests. And then when they hit Linus's tree, when they hit um, next, we run even more tests. Zero day, there's a number of builds and the number of tests that are run. I'm not sure on some of these. Kernel CI isn't publishing how many tests they run yet. Do we run tests in Kernel CI yet? We do. I, I couldn't find the number. Anyway, um, I think you're running about 200 on one of my last reports. 202 different builds and boots on different systems, which is awesome. Uh, Lunaro's OKFT, I made fun of it a long time ago, but it's come up and it's doing really, really well. It's run like over 90,000 different tests on daily on Linus's tree, on Linux's next. Uh, it's doing this stuff. We're finding the bugs and we're fixing them because of this. Gunter runs on every RC, 151 different architectures. He boots QEMU for almost 500 different architectures, which is amazing that QEMU handles that many. And again, on the stable releases, when I do stable releases, Kernel CI is doing it, uh, LKFT, Gunter, Shua, Android sending me responses. The Android tests, they're not public, but they send me private emails. A number of companies send me private emails based on um, the RC releases or based on stable releases. Huawei is publicly doing it. NVIDIA is publicly doing it. Debian and Fedora are doing a great job and publicly sending me bug fixes saying, test these things. Many, many others. And these are tests for fixes that have already been in Linus's tree. And we're finding bugs again. So the goal is to find as many bugs as we can find fix, or as many as we can find, because we're all stupid, we all write bugs, all the core people write bugs, because we're human, let's find them, fix it, move it on, and not blame anybody, because we're all, we're all foolish. Again, I wrote a great rel, rel security hole. Um, so the old mantra, trust, but verify, for the kernel, it's trust, but test, and I'd argue that those bugs that those people submitted 
it would be proven from that paper that they never actually tested those. Because if they had tested those, we would have seen that the very tool that they were saying found these problems would have triggered the fact that they didn't solve the problem. And we could have seen that. And they didn't show that r proof. So test. So if you are a maintainer, you get patches, and you're curious about how they found the bug, push back. See if it, is, if it isn't obvious that it's there. Prove it. And because we have this big, huge development model, I've talked about this in the past, as a maintainer, we have to trust the people underneath us. This is a web of trust. Linus trusts David and Stephen and people to send in patches. He isn't reviewing it all. We trust the people sending us stuff. There's people who send me changes like Johan and Alan Stern and other people that I will just blindly take because I trust them. I trust them not that they got it right, but I trust that they will fix it when they get it wrong. And this is the Linux development model, trust model. And this is what our community has been doing for 25, 30 years. I've said it forever. I've never actually written it down. A number of people asked me to write it down. But like Johan and Alan and me, if I get it wrong, I'll fix it. People in this room take pride in their stuff. We all make mistakes. It's not a big deal. We fix it and we move on because we're here to make the project better. People that run away aren't going to fix it. So this is why it's hard to get core changes into the kernel in some spots because then it puts the responsibility on the maintainer. But for things that are obvious, this is our model. And this is something that the outside community doesn't seem to understand, that we, everybody gets things wrong. And the whole thing that we can do better is to fix it and move on. And thanks. I did it on time. Thank you. Nobody heckled. Ah, nobody heckled. Come on. Questions? Yeah, really. Um, when you say trust but verify, I would say uh, trust the intent. And uh, what I mean by this is the, also the reason why I also ask people to describe their intent in a commit message. Yes. Because in practice, we, we are all wrong from time to time. Yeah. And uh, the best way to detect a bug is that the code does not match uh, what was described in the commit message. Yes, very, very true. Describe what you're doing. If it, if it, as a reviewer, if you see that this doesn't match the text above, well, then that's something, something's wrong, push back. David in the back. OK. Real, real quick, one quick. Answer. <laughs> oh, David's first. Oh, really? It's OK. okay. Well, no. I can try it and we can go through here. Walk, 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 walk your question back. Walk what? your question back. Talk oh, jeez, you're making me. I want to throw it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, ask your question as you walk backwards. I know, but I want to throw no. it. <laughs> OK, no, no, it's not really a question. But one thing I want to state real quick, I'll go on the way, is it's not the fact that just it's trust. Trust takes a bit to build. I also tell people it's very easily to lose it. It's very easy to lose it. Like, and that's actually a fear, I think, at least for me. Like, I make sure I'm always up front with Linus. and like, When I do something that I know Linus may not like, the first thing I put in my change request is what I just did that he does not like. I, I let mean, him know it right up in front. So I mean, we all make mistakes. You know, I all do stupid things. We've all had the email saying, what the hell are you doing? I've, I've written that to other people. And that's fine. Call, call, be call, being called out and doing something wrong is, is part of review. It's part of development. It's part of being human. Another thing that's pretty cool is that like we have a whole bunch of pre-checks and patchwork that like not only check that it builds, but that you know the, the commit message is formatted properly. There's a proper fixes tag there and everything, and it's all things are did away before I even wake up in the morning. And yeah, it's, it's it's the best feeling ever. Right? <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yes, maybe going to be a kind of political question, but have you ever considered uh, a system, a mechanism like Web of Trust to, uh, as for example, Debian developers do to uh, identify all the um, uh, developers and maintainers among themselves? Uh, so we have this. So I, people, a lot of people don't know, and I didn't want to go into this more. We have Web of Trust today. 
I submit patches to public mailing lists that are actually signed with my key. Our tools check that. You can know that this was sent by me. We have a developer, Linux kernel developer, GPG, Ring of Trust, that anybody can download and see that we've signed each other's keys and we've done that. We did that in order to reconstruct the kernel.org infrastructure. It's public to other people and see. You can verify that based on our signed tags that we're sending to Linus who you are. I verify that you, when you're sending me patches, a pull request, I do that as a sign tag. We have that web of trust there today. I don't want to go into that, but it's there. And we use it and we rely on it. Our tools automatically check it. It's awesome. D4 can automatically check that this patch came from me, came from Kevin, came from anybody. Set it up. Constantine's made a trivial to set up and work. Every patch that I send out using git send mail, it's hooked into git send mail. Works great. Um, what would you answer to people who argue that uh, it's easier to find and exploit uh, bugs or uh, zero days in uh, open source software than in closed source software? I, I don't think so, but um, I've never figured out what to answer to people who say that. So it's just as easy to find it both ways. You can reverse engineer binaries trivially. Um, as proof of this, sometimes, I was talking this morning, the kernel security team will get, here's a binary that we captured on the wire that looks like it's a security exploit. Figure out what it is, some people on the security team's like, okay, great, yeah, here's this binary, we can figure out what it does, we know how it's doing this, and we can go from there. Reverse engineering software is trivial. Reverse engineering hardware is trivial. Hardware is supposedly closed source, right? People decap chips and see how they're working all the time. People reverse engineer microcode. It's that is a low barrier for entry. Open source is better and easier to find bugs, it's also easier to fix them. Because again, anybody can fix bugs. Go back in time and do that. We all have bugs, all software has bugs. Our software has been independently audited that open source software has less bugs than closed source software. That's actually research is out there. You can point them at that research. But finding new stuff, it's easy. People look at how many bugs are found in Windows? They have the patch Tuesday, right? We have a patch weekly, <laughs> so it's the same. Willie, up here. Oh. I would say that it's uh, much harder to, in to insert a malicious uh, code in open source uh, than in proprietary code without being discovered. It's because much harder. in a small team, you can consider that probably you put your bug and nobody will look at this code. But when you know that the whole world can look at it, even if the probability is low, uh, it's very hard to remain undiscovered for a very long time. Yeah, so Jason, who did WireGuard and lives here in Paris, famously said, I'm terrified when I send out pa patches on a mailing list. Um, just because it's my name, it's going to be out there forever, so I do my best work. I never had that. He never has that feeling when you're checking code into an internal repository. You sometimes trade off, hey, you, you review my code, you plus two it, I'll plus two yours. Publicly, it's a lot it, more. You should scary. be like us and consider that the whole world already takes him for stupid, and that's all. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and we all write bugs. Writing bugs is, is normal, but fixing them is good. Hey, I ended on time. All right, thank you very much.